Welcome to Immunology, the cells and cellular activities of the immune system, lymphocytes, and plasma cells. At the end of this section, we are also going to cover some electrophoresis. Lymphocytes and plasma cells are something that you've probably had covered in your hematology class by now. Lymphocytes are primarily the cells that fight viruses. Plasma cells are cells that look like a fried egg, that's kind of what you might hear your hematology instructor say, and secrete something called immunoglobulins. So we're going to go through and look at these different types of cells and see exactly what they do with the immune system. But first, let's look at the sites of lymphocytic development. In the yolk sac, which is the first primary site of cell development, um, is where you, it would first begin. Then it would head to the liver and the spleen, and then to the bone marrow. The primary lymphoid tissue in mammals is the bone marrow or the fetal liver, and then once they um, develop, in, more so in the thymus. Here are some pictures of where those places of development might be. Secondary lymphoid tissue, which is where the cells may be stored after they have a role in life and have been exposed to something, include lymph nodes, spleen, the GALT or gut-associated lymphoid tissue, bronchus-associated lymphoid tissue, skin-associated lymphoid tissue, the thoracic duct, and blood. The circulation of the lymphocyte, um, what happens is when they're undifferentiated in the bone marrow, they, uh, that's where they hang out. When they come into the blood or lymph circulation, they then become exposed, get a title in life, and they will travel more so through the lymph system until, until needed. Here's a picture of a lymph node and what it might look like. Looking at lymphoid and non-lymphoid surface membrane markers. You can see here we've got T cells and B cells. They each have a very different role in life. First, looking at the T lymphocytes, we look at their cluster designation antigens. These promote cell-to-cell -cell interactions and adhesions. Now, when you are in your hematology course, you're going to hear them talk about um, how we use these markers to, to figure out what type of cell it is, and sometimes to figure out what type of leukemia that somebody may have. But this is what makes one cell different from the other. It's the transduction of signals that may lead to lymphocyte activation. While the T cells play an important role in the regulation of virtual all re immune responses by providing help for antibody production by B cells and by providing growth factors for B cells. So they do kind of tell everybody what to do. We then have cytokines, chemokines, interleukins, and tumor necrosis factor that come into play as well. Cytokines are soluble mediators. Interleukins are made by and act on leukocytes. Chemokines are cytokines that stimulate leukocyte movement towards the injury site. Interleukins are cytokines in virally infected cells. And tumor necrosis factor is great at mediating an acute immune response against gram-negative bacteria. Here's something that you may be familiar with with your hematology class as well. When it comes to the lymphoid stem cell, you can see the different CD markers that might be present. It will then turn into either a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte. Depending on what that lymphocyte is, they're going to have different cluster designation markers. Most students say that the T cells are pretty famous for their less than 10 CD markers, as you can see, 8, 7, 5, 4, 3, and 2, where the B cells have more of the um, numbers above 10. Here's an example of a flow cytometer um, that might be used to test for different CD markers. Different cells have different CD markers, which is how we can tell um, by doing something called flow cytometry how many of each type of cell there are. In the hematology department, all we can do is tell the physician, this is how many lymphocytes you have. The flow cytometry department can tell them how many um, T cells, like T4 cells, T8 cells, B cells. It can tell them um, any, anything about any of them. So it's more specific. As you can see here, I have um, a list of the different markers. NK are natural killer cells that we'll talk about in a minute. They're able to lyse virally infected cells and tumor cells. Those are usually have CD16 and CD56. Helper T cells release cytokines and growth factors that regulate other immune cells, so they help out. They have CD3 and 4. Cytotoxic T cells are lyse virally infected cells, tumor cells, and allografts, so they're very cytotoxic. 
and those have CD3 and CD8. Notice that cytotoxic has eight, helper has four. We're going to get to that in a little while. B cells have the secretion of antibodies. All right, so let's look at the different subsets. I kind of talked about these um, a minute ago, but we're going to go over them again because they're very important. The helper T cells, CD4, how do you memorize that? Well, help, H-E-L-P, has four letters, and CD4 has the four, so four and four letters. This produces interleukins, which are made by and act on leukocytes. A couple different types of T helper cells, T1, um, T helper 1, T helper 2, and T regulatory. T helper 1 has effector mechanisms. T helper 2 regulates antibody production. T regulator is an immunoregulatory type of T helper cell, so it helps regulate things and keep them under control. Then we've got the cytotoxic, or CD8 cell. This one is capable of destroying virally infected cells and the suppressor cell, which downregulates other T cells and B cells. Those have CD8 markers. Now, suppressor, I think, does it have eight letters? No, it's got a little more than that, but we'll pretend it does. So that's how you know suppressors are CD8s and helpers are CD4. Important to know when we start talking about HIV. We'll get to that a little bit later. The ratio of T helper to T suppressor is usually two to one. You want more helpers than suppressors. We also have the antigen processing and antigen presentation to T cells. Two pathways can occur. First one is the endogenous pathway. When this happens, a cell processes proteins that have been internalized. Okay, so let's say it eats a, a bacteria. It processes it into fragments and re-expresses it at the cell surface, which would be more of a um, T suppressor type of cell. The exogenous pathway is soluble proteins are taken up from the extracellular environment by specialized antigen uh, processing cells. The antigens are then processed in acidic vessels called enzosomes, which are brought to the cell surface, which would be more of a CD4. When activated by proper signals, the T cells can proliferate, which means make more of itself, differentiate and help different situations, help um, produce cytokines, and develop an effector type of function. Here's the natural killer and K-type cells. You will need to know the difference. Natural killer cells destroy target cells through an extracellular non-phagocytic mechanism called cytotoxic reaction. There is major histocompatibility complex, unrestric unrestricted cytolysis, and non-specific killing. So it'll just kill anything in its way. K-type lymphocytes are a little bit different. These are mononuclear cells that can kill cells that have an antibody attached to it. So natural killer can kill anything. K-type needs to have an antibody. Next, we'll look at the B lymphocytes. These secrete antibodies, and um, they have different types of CD markers as well. B1 cells possess CD5 marker. B2 cells account for the majority of um, B lymphocytes. They demonstrate surface immunoglobulin. They can di differentiate into plasma cells with antigenic stimulation. Remember, the plasma cells release antibody. And they also participate in the amnestic response as memory cells. Remember, the amnestic response is known as the secondary response. B lymphocytes are cell surface, they have cell surface markers on them. We got surface immunoglobulin receptor on here. It's an antibody molecule with an antigenic specificity to it. It has an FC receptor, which specifically binds the FC portion of the immunoglobulin. It can aid B cells in the binding to the antigen already on the antibody. C3, which is a receptor that binds fragments of the cleaved complement component. And B cell surface antigens are coded by major histocompatibility um, class 2 genes. Some things you need to know about B cell activation. They can be stimulated into their resting state to become bigger, develop machinery, divide, mature, and secrete antibodies. If you um, have bacterial infections, B cell deficiency can um, lead to, or you can get B cell deficiency from having bacterial infections. A couple other types of lymphocytes, um, virgin or naive lymphocytes have not encountered their specific antigen, so they don't have a, a, a job yet in life. They're just kind of floating around waiting. Then we can have memory cells, which are long-lived tier B cells that have been stimulated by an antigen. Um, for example, after you get a vaccination, you would have memory cells that help memorize that vaccine that you received. <laughs>
With plasma cell biology, the function is synthesis and excretion of immunoglobulins. They arise as end-stage B cell differentiation, and the pathway from B cell plasma cell occurs when a B cell is antigenically stimulated and undergoes transformation as a result of a stimulation of those interleukins that are kind of the communication between white cells. Some of the changes with, loop, with lymphocytes as you get older. In older adults, we have an increase in T helper cells and a decrease in T suppressor cells. B cells usually remain unchanged. In most cases, we can do a complete blood count and an erythrocyte sedimentation rate to see if there's um, how many lymphocytes there are. We can do an absolute lymphocyte, absolute lymphocyte count, which you should be doing in hematology right now, which is done in this manner. You take the total number of WBCs times the percent of them, and it will give you an ab absolute number, which is more important to know than the relative number. Usually, things that can cause primary you know, immune disorders are shown here. Most of them are a B cell deficiency, 53%. 14% are disorders with the phagocytosis. 7% might be a T cell deficiency. 23% are actually severe combined immunodeficiency, which is the inappropriate development of stem cells. So in that case, you'd really have a hard time fighting off any types of um, infections. Here's a list, I don't want you to memorize this, of some types of deficiencies that um, could cause immune system disorders. We can also have secondary immunodeficiencies. These can result from a disease process that causes a defect in the normal immune function. This leads to temporary or permanent impairment. Some things um, of importance here are um, that you're probably familiar with is AIDS. Okay, AIDS is not what you primarily get. First, the HIV virus attacks the T helper cells. Once the T helper cells are decreased, we have an increase of T suppressor cells because they kind of start to flip-flop. You're supposed to have more helpers than suppressors. Once the helpers go down and the suppressors go up, you enter acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So what happens at that point? You end up with a viral infection, such as cytomegalovirus or toxo, well, I don't want to say toxoplasmosis, it's more parasitic. Um, something like there's certain TBs that they get, they can get Legionella, there's all kinds of things that these AIDS patients die from that usually don't affect us. So that would be a secondary immunodeficiency. Some immune-mediated diseases. Um, we find different hypersensitivities with things and autoimmune um, diseases as well involve these T and B cells. We'll get into more detail with what you see on here later on, but I just wanted to bring it up briefly. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about electrophoresis techniques. You had an introduction to this in your chemistry one course, but we're going to bring it back again. This time we're going to talk about immunoelectrophoresis. Well, you've heard that we separate proteins by electrophoresis into albumins and globulins. Let's say we have an increase in globulins, okay? So if we have an increase in globulins, we want to figure out what kind, okay? Do we have increased IgM? Do we have increased IgG, IgA, IgD? There's a whole bunch of them. So the physician's going to want to know if they have an increase in globulins, exactly which one is increased. We do something similar. We separate them into five fractions on cellulose acetate. Immunoelectrophoresis is known as the electrophoresis of serum followed by immunodiffusion. In the electrophoresis stage, we place the serum on a medium. Remember that big thing looked like a jello jiggler for um, your electrophoresis in chemistry one. Usually using cellulose acetate or agarose, and then it's electrophoresis to separate it according to the electrophoretic mobilities. Albumin would be first, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, gamma globulin. Gamma globulin is what we're going to be looking at for the immunoelectrophoresis. Then we have the diffusion stage. These fractions are allowed to act as antigens and interact with the antibodies. So what we do is we take antiserum and we place it in a trough on one side of the gel, parallel to the proteins, and incubation lets the antigens and antibodies diffuse towards each other. Okay? If there is an antigen antibody complex that are compatible, a precipitin line will form. Don't worry, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Each line represents one specific protein. The proteins are then differentiated by electrophoretic mobility and diffusion and antibody specificity.
Usually these precipitin bands have normal curvature, symmetry, length, position, intensity, and distance from the antigen well. In normal serum, you'll see IgG, IgA, and IgM. IgE and IgD should be too low to be detected, but um, if they do show up, it could be an issue with those areas. Here's what those bands look like. They kind of create an arc to where the antigen and antibody are um, coming together. Some of the clinical ap applications of this, if we do have an increase in those gamma globulins, the doctor is going to want to know which one to help diagnose diseases. So we can detect structural abnormalities and concentration changes in the proteins. We can diagnose monoclonal gammopathy. If you have a monoclonal gammopathy, that could be a condition in which a single clone of plasma cells produces an elevated level of a single class of immunoglobulin. That could mean something like multiple myeloma or macroglobulinemia. With multiple myeloma, a really big one is um, immunoelectrophoresis to demonstrate Bence jones protein. We'll find that in the urine as well. That is a tumor marker for multiple myeloma. Usually if someone, like my um, husband's grandmother died of this, and she, they found a lot of protein in her urine, so she was surprised by it just as much as they were. Upon doing blood tests, they found increased protein in her serum. So they did serum protein electrophoresis, they found increased gamma globulins. They did those gamma globulins and found out that it was a multiple myeloma, and the Benz Jones protein was um, positive in her urine. They did try chemotherapy against those plasma cells that were proliferating that Ben Jones protein like crazy um, without a whole lot of success, but she, she was very old and it was very hard on her body. With this immunofixation electrophoresis, there's a two-stage procedure using the electrophoresis and then the immunoprecipitation that we talked about. You, we can do it on serum, urine, spinal fluid, or anything else, and we look for those monoclonal immunoglobulins to check for um, a certain immunoglobulin that's being produced like crazy. The procedure for the immunofixation piece is the proteins are separated. Okay, We've got the IgG, IgA, IgM, plus you can have kappa and lambda. And we talked about this before. You don't see IgD and IgE because it is too low. A protein fixative is applied to the sixth pattern to um, complete a protein reference. If the complementary antigen is present, we'll get that arc. Okay, so here's another picture of what this might look like. And how do we differentiate between immunoelectrophoresis and immunofixation? In IEP, antiserum is applied in a trough to diffuse through. In IFP, it's directly on the surface. So that is the difference between the two. This is something that you're very unlikely to do um, once you get out to your clinical site or to, um, you know, or in life in general. It's usually done more so in a reference laboratory than it would be in a typical day-to-day -day hospital or clinic. All right, that concludes my section of um, immunoelectrophoresis and T-cells and B-cells.